intend to be where the light and darkness meet on the edge of the horizon through the trees I am a narcissist crippled with self-doubt I've got a courage that brings me to my knees hello hi and howdy how's everyone doing today I certainly hope everyone's doing great if this is your first time visiting my channel, my name is Jenny and I'm ecstatic to meet you. If you get anything out of this content, please consider taking a moment to like and subscribe and leave me a comment. Let me know your thoughts on the story that you're watching or just to say hello. If you're a return visitor, as always, welcome back. Today's story is a suggestion from Nikki Bywall. Nikki, if you're watching, thank you so much for the suggestion. Now let's jump in. Riley Ann Sawyers was born on the 11th of March in 2005. She was born in Mentor, Ohio to parents Robert Sawyer and Kimberly Dawn Trenner. Her parents were young when Kimberly conceived Riley. In fact, Kimberly was only 15 years old when Robert and Kimberly had Riley. Robert dropped out of high school during his junior year and the couple lived with Robert's mother, Cheryl, who quickly became Riley's primary caretaker. Very quickly, Robert and Kimberly started arguing regularly and decided to end their relationship, but both remained living at Robert's mother's for the time being. Pretty quickly, Robert began dating Katherine Priester, who became his wife. In October of 2006, Robert contacted law enforcement and filed charges against Kimberly for DV. Robert then moved out of his mother's home, leaving Kimberly and Riley with Cheryl. Kimberly soon started talking to Royce Ziegler, who she met on World of Warcraft. In May of 2007, Kimberly took Riley and moved to Spring, Texas to be with her gaming lover. It was said that Robert, Kimberly, and Royce all spent a lot of their time on the game of World of Warcraft. On the 1st of June in 2007, Kimberly married Royce. This was the beginning of the end for poor Riley, who I almost guarantee Cheryl would have gladly kept and gave a wonderful life and let Kimberly and Royce have their own life together. Kimberly claimed that when she first moved to Texas, things were great. She said Royce would buy Riley things like toys and clothes, and he also purchased Kimberly a van. She said that at first he took no part in disciplining Riley. Kimberly claimed that Riley had behavioral issues um, beyond that of what you would expect out of a normal two-year-old. She said she dealt with the behavior with timeouts, and Royce would tell her she needed to be more aggressive than timeout. He told her she should be using a belt. Before long, he began disciplining Riley. Oh, that makes me so angry. God, I hate when... Roy Siegler's stepmothers, yes, yeah, stepmothers as in plural, said that Royce's father believed in corporal punishment and used it when disciplining Royce. Unfortunately, instead of Royce realizing the pain that this caused him, he decided that it was the way to raise children. And Royce was very firm in his belief that Riley should say sir and ma'am when she addressed them. She also was to say, please and thank you. Riley would say, I won't when she wanted something, which is common for a child of only two years old. But he insisted that she should be saying, please, can I have instead? And at barely two years old, um, he was out of his mind. He believed that if she didn't say it, she should be punished. And I don't mean sit down and explain to a two-year-old his expectations, as he is another legend in his own mind and felt that a belt needed to be used on a two-year-old. When he didn't believe Kimberly um, administered the punishment enough to suit him, he would step in and do it himself. At one point, Royce's mother saw bruises on Riley's little bottom. She told Kimberly and Royce that they needed to use their hands, not a belt. She didn't call anyone to help Riley. She just basically told adults, shame on you, do better. I've said this before, um, but why do women meet a man and allow him to discipline their children? Why? 
Ladies, if you meet a man and this man tells you you don't beat your child enough, it's time to move on. And if it was her love for him, why didn't she leave Riley with Cheryl where she was safe? I saw the pain in Cheryl's eyes when she was interviewed, and I just I firmly believe she would have raised this baby with love. I'd almost guarantee it. But anyway, enough of my opinion. Back to the story. On the 29th of October in 2007, a fisherman named Robert Spinn from Bayou Vista in Galveston County said he was out fishing for flounder when he turned his boat towards an island separating the bay from intercoastal waterway. He saw an upside down blue box on the shore of this small island. He further said, quote, I was just curious as to what it was that it might have been fishing gear. He explained that when he turned the box over, he heard a thud, and it didn't sound right. It did not sound like fishing gear. Inside the box, he found a plastic bag with clay and concrete. He cut the plastic and smelled decomposition, and he knew whatever it was wasn't alive. He testified during the trial that at first he thought someone had put their pet into a box. He ripped the bag further open with his fishing pliers, and he saw a shoe. He knew then that this was a person. He testified that he then called his wife and then 911. A coroner discovered three skull fractures on the small body found in the Galveston Bay. The case then proceeded as a case of violent and aliving. The injuries were described as having similar force to falling from a rooftop. When unable to identify the remains, the body was nicknamed Baby Grace. Due to decomposition, a photo of the child found wouldn't have been recognizable, so renowned forensic artist Lewis Gibson was brought in. He created a forensic sketch to illustrate what the child would have looked like while alive. The sketch was released to the public and hundreds of tips from all over the world poured in until eventually it was seen online by Riley Ann Sawyer's grandmother, Cheryl, the same grandmother that was initially her caretaker. Cheryl contacted the authorities to inform them that the sketch resembled her granddaughter. She told them that she and her son had been trying to find Riley since July when Kimberly showed up claiming she gave her to someone and even presented her with custody papers that appeared to be legitimate. The authorities felt due to Cheryl's statements, this could be Riley. At the request of Galveston County Sheriff's Office, a Harrison County Sheriff's Deputy, Deputy Jones, went to the home where Royce and Kimberly were living, supposedly with Riley, to do a welfare check. The deputy spoke to Royce, and he told the deputy that there was a custody dispute with Riley's biological father, Robert, who lived in Ohio. He said that a representative from the Ohio Department of Child Services had come to their home, pushed Kimberly down, and taken Riley back to Ohio. You know, like, that wouldn't be easy to confirm. Deputy Jones asked if Kimberly had any paperwork from Ohio CPS documenting that they took Riley, and Kimberly said that she did and would send it to the deputy. She sent the same paperwork that she had shown Cheryl, Riley's grandmother. At first, Deputy Jones believed Kimberly that the Ohio CPS had taken Riley until Kimberly became uncooperative and was hesitant to file a police report to report her daughter missing. It was determined that the documents were indeed fake and had been created by Kimberly, which should have been another charge. DNA testing was done on eight families with missing children resembling baby Grace. One of the DNA samples was submitted by Robert Sawyers, Riley Ann Sawyers' father. The 30th of November, DNA confirmed the child in the box, Baby Grace, was indeed two-year-old Riley Ann Sawyers. The investigation into what happened to Riley began. A few days later, Royce Ziegler tried to unalive himself by taking too many blood pressure pills and his prescribed antidepressant medication. He left a note stating, quote, my wife is innocent of the sins that I have committed. On the 27th of November, Kimberly Dawn Trenner, at 19 years old, 
gave a chilling videotaped confession to the investigators at Galveston County Sheriff's Office. Uh, okay, y'all, this is my content warning. Um, this is fixing to get hard to hear. So just know this before continuing to listen. The jury of five men and seven women were wiping away tears while listening to what this baby endured. Per Kimberly Don Trenner, Roy Ziegler took the day off work as he didn't think Kimberly was properly administering punishment to Riley with the belt. He felt she needed a day-long disciplinary session that included beating with belts, plural, and holding Riley's head under the water and throwing her onto a hard tile floor. Kimberly said that Royce told her, quote, we have to break her. If that was my child, something would have got broke. He said that she had to learn to always say please and thank you, sir and ma'am, when spoken to, and that she had other behaviors that bothered him that needed correcting. She told the investigators that the punishment started in the bedroom where he took a thin black belt and started hitting her with it. While doing this, he shoved her face into the pillow and was screaming loudly at her. Then he grabbed her and pulled her into the family room. He hit her some more with the thin black belt, but then he grabbed a thicker one because it would cause more pain. He told Kimberly at this time to fill up the tub with cold water, and she did. He then drug Riley into the bathroom by her hair. He held her under the water every time she screamed, and he would tell her not to scream, and how would anybody, even an adult, not scream when somebody's hitting them? Okay, y'all, this next part, it broke me, so be ready. In the middle of all of this, Kimberly said that Riley looked right at her and said, Mommy, I love you. Kimberly said that Royce then told her that Riley was just trying to manipulate her. Sorry, y'all. I had to regain my composure for a moment. Um, Kimberly then said that Royce told her that Riley was doing nothing but trying to manipulate her by saying this. And then he just kept, as they called it, punishing her. Royce then hurled Riley to the floor three times so hard that Kimberly said she heard a loud crack. Riley tried to run. Royce hooked the belt around her little neck and drug her back. Kimberly said it just went on and on and no matter what Riley tried to say, she was going to get hit with the belt. Royce then grabbed Riley's little right hand and bit it. Kimberly then admitted that she also hit Riley using the belt when Royce told her to do so. And sorry, chick, that's not an excuse there, ma'am. She said that Riley's body was black and blue and she was ordered to stand, but she was unable to do so as she no longer had control of her legs. Royce told Kimberly that Riley was faking not having control of her legs to scare them into stopping, and he just continued to hit her. Kimberly said that Royce then started holding Riley, trying to get her to stand, but she just kept falling. He finally realized something was bad wrong, so he tried to give her Tylenol because, you know, a true humanitarian here, bub. She couldn't chew or swallow to even take the Tylenol at this point, and this is when they realize something is seriously, seriously wrong. And seriously, this, this is when. Kimberly said that she wanted to call 911, but Royce told her no. He said that if they call 911, they will go to jail. She said before long, Riley was not breathing. She said that Royce tried to start CPR, it wasn't working, so he put his finger down her throat to see if the Tylenol was lodged in her throat, but he didn't feel it, so he instructed Kimberly to do the same. When this didn't work, Kimberly said that um, he just handed her to me, and I could feel her going cold. Mm. She said that Riley passed away in her arms. She said that Royce then wrapped 
Riley's little battered body in a purple towel and put her in the bathtub. She said that they then went to Walmart, purchased a blue plastic box. When they returned home, Kimberly said that Roy scrubbed Riley's little body with bleach and even poured some down her throat to eliminate any fingerprints or DNA being found. Kimberly said that she then insisted they dress Riley. They then stuffed her lifeless body into three plastic bags. She said she was told to get Royce a cup of water, which he then mixed with quick cement and put it into the bags and placed it into the blue box and put the whole box with Riley in a backyard storage shed for at least a month. During this time, per Kimberly, Royce dictated to her how to write the paperwork claiming she gave away Riley to show Riley's father and grandmother, though per Galveston County Sheriff's Sergeant Michael Berry, he later discovered that Royce dictating the document couldn't be true as Royce was out of town when it was written, though he also said it was the only thing in her confession that he could prove was false. One night, they decided they needed to discard the box with Riley in it. They drove into the woods and attempted to um, dig a hole, but it was taking too long. And um, so apparently these two are also not only cruel monsters, but they are too lazy to dig a hole. So they drove the next day onto the railroad bridge next to the causeway and Royce tossed the box containing Riley into the sea. She said that Royce then began to panic as the box floated away, saying that he should have drilled holes in it so it would have sank. She was asked if she was scared of Royce and she told them that he was never violent towards her and she wasn't scared of him hurting her at all. She was scared he would leave her with nothing. So basically, her van was more important to her than the life of this little girl, an innocent little girl. Both Kimberly Dawn Trenner and Royce Clyde Ziegler II were arrested and held on separate bonds of $850,000 each per the Houston Chronicle. Initially, they were charged with injury to a child and tampering with evidence, but after the full confession, they were charged with capital unaliving, and Royce was also charged with evidence tampering. The first to stand trial was Kimberly, though her trial was delayed due to her being pregnant. She gave birth while incarcerated in June of 2008 to a little boy she named Sean, who was then turned over to relatives. Her rights to her son were relinquished. District Attorney Sistrunk decided not to seek the unalived penalty because of a state appeals court decision saying that the unalived penalty isn't appropriate in cases involving parents unaliving their children. And I wonder why. Do they find it less heinous when it's a parent? Now, I know that I've compared a few of these cases to Casey Anthony, but I'm going to use her case as an example once again. Um, please keep in mind, I am not an attorney nor am I a judge, so this is my opinion, only my opinion. I see people continue to claim the jury was blind in her case, and I do not believe this is true. The state of Florida chose to go after first degree unaliving and didn't back down from this. The problem was for the charge of first degree, the state must prove intent. This means they must prove that what Casey did or for legal reasons may have done, she did with the full intent to take her life. Due to decomp, they couldn't prove the method that was used in her unaliving. Without the method, it would be hard to prove her intent was to take Kaylee's life as the defense only had to offer possibilities that they offered to the jury, such as drowned in the pool or even the OD on anti-anxiety medication when that she was giving her to put her to sleep so she could go out and party. Anyways, the defense in this case made a point to tell the jury that neither Kimberly Trenner nor Royce Ziegler intended or foresaw that Riley would be unalived by the punishment. They were trying to prove to the jury that the intent wasn't there, so the jury couldn't find them guilty of capital unaliving. Both Kimberly Trenner and Royce Ziegler 
did eventually take responsibility for what happened to baby Riley Ann Sawyers, however. Kimberly Trenner was convicted of capital unaliving on the 2nd of February in 2009. It only took the jury 90 minutes to reach this verdict. She was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. She is serving her time at the Mountain View Unit in Gatesville, Texas. Roy Siegler was convicted of capital unaliving and evidence tampering on the 6th of November in 2009. He was also sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. The jury took four and a half hours to reach this verdict. He is serving his sentence in Wallace Pack Unit near Navasota, Texas. On the 14th of January in 2008, a Texas judge ruled that evidence collected during the autopsy would be sufficient for trial and turn custody of the cremated remains of Riley Ann Sawyers over to her family in Ohio. Cheryl Sawyer's employer held a fundraiser and raised the money to pay for a funeral for baby Riley. A ceremony took place and Riley's remains were entered at the Mentor Municipal Cemetery. The Hitchcock City Commission in Texas in a public meeting announced they were getting ready to find out who owned the Narrow Island in Galveston where Robert Spin discovered Riley's remains and the owner spoke up from the audience. The island was owned by Kenny Stewart, a retired railroad conductor. He gave permission for the city to name the island Riley's Island. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of baby Riley Ann Sawyer's story. And as always, rest easy, Riley. Rest easy, baby girl. You are free. If you get anything out of this content and have not done so yet, please consider taking a moment to like and subscribe and to hit the little notification bell down below. And until the next video, toodles. I am me parts sacred and profane I live my life that way I live my life that way Since I left the world And I am equal parts